Hello there geographers and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to talk about the world economy as we explore the wonderful world of global trade. As always, if you find value in these videos, consider subscribing. Now thanks to globalization, the world has become increasingly interconnected as people, cultures, economies, and nations across the globe trade and interact every day. All of this has had a profound impact on the global economy. Countries today have opened up their markets for goods and services to the world, which increases the amount of competition in the market and allows for consumers to have more choices. Capital investments are now being made in countries around the world, allowing for more investment opportunities for individuals and new economic opportunities for people in the periphery, semi-periphery, and core regions of the world. Globalization has also allowed businesses to gain access to the global labor market, creating new opportunities for businesses to produce their products and new opportunities for workers in all countries. But at the same time, this new global market has also contributed to the rise in income inequality as economic benefits of the new globalized world have not equally been distributed across all states. Now there is a variety of different reasons as to why countries today participate in the global economy. We can see that countries that trade with other countries gain access to natural resources that they themselves may lack. Countries that are able to participate in the global labor market are often able to produce more goods, see improved efficiency and productivity, gain the ability to specialize more, access new technologies and ideas, and can even strengthen their political relationships with other countries. When looking at global trade, we can see that countries that have a stronger trade complementary index score will be more likely to trade with one another. The complementary index compares the export patterns of a country and the import patterns of another country. A higher score indicates a more favorable trade relationship. The complementary index can range anywhere from zero to a hundred, with zero meaning the two countries do not complement each other at all, and a score of a hundred meaning the two countries' exports and imports perfectly match. For example, we can see here that Chile's imports are more complementary with countries in North America compared to countries that are in Latin America. By looking at this data from the World Trade Organization, we can see that Chile and the United States are the most compatible trade partners, while Bolivia and Peru are the least compatible. So it makes more sense for Chile to trade with countries in North America, even though countries in Latin America are geographically closer. Now, it isn't just the complementary index that establishes the basis for trade between two countries. We can also look at a concept known as comparative advantage. Countries with a comparative advantage have a lower opportunity cost than another country at producing a specific good or service. To understand this concept, think about yourself. Every day, you only have 24 hours to get things done and do what you want to do. So every Every day you are impacted by scarcity. You only have so much time in a day to do things, which means you need to make choices, which result in trade-offs. You simply cannot do everything you want to do in a day. Generally, you'll end up focusing on doing what interests you and what you are good at doing, which makes sense. For example, I'm pretty good at creating AP Human Geography videos, but I have no idea at all on how to fix my car. However, the mechanic down the street is really good at fixing cars, but not the best at making AP Human Geography Video. Here we can see it's actually in our best interest for both of us to specialize on what we do best. I could try to go on YouTube and learn how to fix my car, but it would take me a long time. It would take me a lot of energy and probably lots of money since most likely I would end up only making the problem worse. Instead of trying to fix the car myself, it would be worth it for me to pay the mechanic to fix my car instead. This would end up saving me time, money, and also result in me being more productive and happier. When we specialize, we become more efficient. And when we we trade with others, we are able to become better off than if we decided to do it ourselves. So that was a small individual example of this concept. Now let's go back and look at countries and comparative advantage. When countries have a comparative advantage in the production of a particular good or service, it means that they are more efficient at producing that good or service than another country. Now everyday countries have to decide on what products and services they want to produce, but they only have so many resources, workers, and time. Every time they decide to produce one product or service, they end up using resources, workers, and money that can't be used to do something else. If countries practice isolationist policies and attempt to produce everything themselves, they will end up becoming less efficient and end up having less goods and services. But when countries focus on what they are good at, instead of trying to produce everything, they can become more specialized and also more efficient, resulting in more production of that particular good or service. Countries then can participate in the global 
economy and trade to get other goods and services that they do not have a comparative advantage in. This allows the country to not only maximize their own efficiency, but still get all of the goods and services that they want, since trading allows them to be better off than if they tried to produce the goods themselves. So we can see that instead of trying to produce everything, countries should produce products that they have a comparative advantage in, and then trade with countries who have a comparative advantage in the production of other goods. Just like my example of me making AP Human Geography videos, or trying to fix my car, I have a comparative advantage in producing YouTube videos, compared to my mechanic who has a comparative advantage in fixing cars. By understanding the complementary trade index and comparative advantage, we can gain insight into why countries trade with one another. When countries specialize and take advantage of their respective strengths and acknowledge their weaknesses, it allows for them to become more productive and efficient. Today, we can see that different government policies and initiatives not only influence this global trade, but all levels of a state's economy. For example, we can see that some countries seek to reduce trade and promote domestic production. One way in which this can be accomplished is by implementing tariffs. A tariff is a tax or duty imposed by a government on goods and services that are imported into the country. The goal is to make goods that are produced outside of a country's boundaries more expensive to ultimately motivate consumers to purchase goods that were made domestically. This happens because the domestic goods do not have the tariff impacting their price. Now it is important to note that the tariff is not paid by the country or government that the tariff is put on. In fact, it's paid by the business. However, we can see that businesses normally pass the extra expenses on to the consumer by raising the price of the product that was impacted by the tariff. So ultimately, the consumer is the one who ends up paying for the tariff. Oftentimes, countries will put tariffs in place if domestic production is more expensive than foreign production, or if the country has a trade deficit with another country that it wants to reduce. A trade deficit occurs when a country imports more goods and services from another country than it exports. Many economists such as Milton Friedman argued that a trade deficit should not be a concern for countries because countries willingly engage in trade with other countries. Friedman argued that policies such as tariffs end up distorting the price of the market and prevent the market from efficiently using its resources. Friedman believed that it was better for countries to increase trade with other countries and allow for free market competition, which would result in economic prosperity. This idea of promoting free trade and increasing global trade is known as neoliberalism, which is characterized by policies that seek to reduce the amount of government intervention in the economy and promote free market capitalism. These policies often focus on private ownership, free trade, and individual freedom over government-controlled businesses. When looking at the world today, we can see a variety of different organizations and trade deals which are based off neoliberal policies. Organizations such as the World Trade Organization have been created to try and promote globalization and free trade around the world. The World Trade Organization provides a forum for negotiating agreements aimed at reducing obstacles to international trade and ensuring a level playing field for all, thus contributing to economic growth and development. The primary purpose of the organization is to open trade for the benefit of all. Another organization we can look at is the impact that the International Monetary Fund has had on the global market. The IMF has three critical missions. Furthering international monetary cooperation, encouraging the expansion of trade and economic growth, and discouraging policies that would harm prosperity. These missions all connect back to the idea of promoting sustainable economic growth for countries around the world through trade and commerce. We can also look at other organizations that promote globalization, such as Mercosur, the European Union, and OPEC, just to name a few. Mercosur consists of different countries in South America, with its main objective being to promote a common space that generates business and investment opportunities through competitive integration of national economies into the international market. The European Union is a political and economic union of states primarily located in Europe. It was created with the goal of promoting peace, stability, and economic prosperity in the region. Today, some of the European Union's overall goals are to establish an internal market, achieve sustainable development based on balanced economic growth and price stability, and a highly competitive market economy with full employment and social progress, enhance economic, social, and territorial cohesion and solidarity among EU countries, and establish an economic and monetary union whose currency is the euro. There are many other goals of the organization, but overall we can see a focus to increase trade and commerce between members to promote economic growth for all. The last organization I want 
wanted to mention was OPEC, which is a little bit more controversial. We can see that OPEC's objective is to coordinate and unify petroleum policies among member countries in order to secure fair and stable prices for petroleum producers. On one hand, we can see how OPEC goes against a free market system and competition by using its control over oil production to influence the global supply of oil and ultimately the price of oil, which restricts competition and can artificially inflate prices. But on the other hand, we could also see aspects of OPEC that do promote neoliberal policies, such as efficiently using resources, allowing for stabilization to occur in oil prices, and by promoting stable economic growth for all oil producing countries in the organization. Neoliberal policies have also led to the creation of free trade agreements, such as NAFTA, which was replaced by the USMCA in 2020. The goal here is to bring free trade between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, promoting economic growth and stability in the region. At the end of the day, we can see how neoliberal policies have encouraged the development of global trade networks and have led to the creation of new spatial connections between countries and regions around the world. Now, just like everything else we've talked about, there is negative aspects to neoliberal policies as well. Critics have pointed out that oftentimes neoliberal policies prioritize the needs of wealthier corporations and states over the developing regions, which often increases economic inequality around the world. Deregulation of different markets can also lead to less accountability and government oversight, which may increase unethical behavior by different institutions. These policies could also negatively impact the stability of developing nations as they now are competing with states whose economies are more advanced and are made up with more advanced robust technology and infrastructure. These policies could also hurt workers in more economically advanced regions as they now have to compete with workers in less economically developed areas, which often work at a much cheaper rate. Now, a connected global community also means that crises in one part of the world will have a ripple effect on the larger global community. Such was the case in 2008 when the financial market collapsed in the United States, which ended up impacting the entire global community for years to come. Or we could look at another example, such as COVID-19, which resulted in the global economy grinding to a halt, resulting in mass shortages and broken supply chains around the world, all of which left governments scrambling to pivot to protect their citizens and keep their economies from collapsing. Speaking of supply chains, we can also look at how the global economy can be impacted by something as simple as a blocked canal, which we saw in May 2021 when the Ever Given ran aground in the Suez Canal, blocking access to the canal. This canal is one of the busiest trade routes in the world, and the blocking of the canal was estimated to cost around $9.6 billion in trade a day, which we could break down to $400 million an hour. So we can see that when problems do arise in the global economy, the consequences can be quite significant. So what do you think? Do the benefits outweigh the negatives? Let me know in the comment section down below. One thing is for sure though, as time goes on, countries will only continue to become more interdependent. Organizations such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank continue to work to promote economic development around the world. This often happens through micro lending, resulting in more economies becoming closely connected and dependent on one another. At the end of the day, we can see that every level of society is impacted by our global community. At the local scale, workers now compete with a global workforce, which leads to a more productive workforce, but also means the loss of jobs as businesses relocate work to cheaper labor markets. At the national scale, we can see the impact that government policies have, not only on the price of goods, but the availability of those goods in society. As national policies shape the ability of companies and individuals to compete in the global economy, and at the global scale, we can see how individual economies of states around the world all influence and impact one another, resulting in one interconnected economy for better and worse. But that's enough economics talk for one day. Now comes the time to practice what we have learned. Answer the questions on the screen, and when you're done, check your answers in the comment section down below. Remember, if you found value in this video, consider subscribing. And if you need more help in your AP Human Geography class, don't forget to check out my ultimate review packet for more exclusive resources and videos that'll not only help you get an A in your class, but a five on the national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time online.